Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. Um, Becky Weber, thank you so much for being here. I fell in love with the M collection when I was touring the new hooker showroom, which was gorgeous. I have so many questions about it. First, I wanted to know a little bit about your background and where you were before hooker and what brought you to them. Uh-huh. Well, great. I'm, I'm so excited that you, um, has such a strong response to it. That's awesome. The showroom was amazing. The, you know, the reaction has been really positive. So that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. M most of my history has been at Crate and Barrel. So I worked there for, um, for 30 years because I started when I was 12. Um, <laughs> but I, I started working there when I was um, going to interior design school in Chicago, just kind of fell in love with the whole retail vibe and everything about the company. I left to do my design job, design work, didn't really love it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of one of those moments where I was down on Michigan Avenue in 1990 when the new flagship store opened up and I went in on, on opening day and saw all these people that I knew. And I was like, it, that store was so um, forward at the time. And I went home and told my husband, I'm like, I have to go back to Crane Barrel. And six months later, I was back and I never left. I started in sales and then I worked, I went the design route just because of my background. And as Crate started building up their furniture division, I got more involved with that end of business and did lots of store openings and visual merchandising. And then they asked me to move up to corporate and I was a buyer's assistant. And then I became an assistant buyer and you know, had all these category um, buys that I would do, uh, product development and merchandising, uh, sourcing. And when I left, I was overseeing many, many categories, all, primarily all in the furniture uh, division. Um, so, but it was decor and textiles and upholstery and case goods. Yeah, after 30 years, I left and went on my own. You know, I really feel like being a merchant is still an important role in our business. So I start my own consulting business. Unfortunately, that was around COVID, <laughs> not the best time, but got um, hooked up with the folks at Hooker through a mutual connection when they were trying to um, research doing a modern brand. So that's M. M feels like a real departure from what I traditionally think of as Hooker furniture. So what was the impetus for the dire that direction? What inspired yeah. that change? You know, exactly that. They, um, you know, is as we know, the modern, um, it's an aesthetic and a lifestyle. People are moving in that direction with less cluttered homes and open floor plans. A hooker really felt that uh, they wanted to get in on that on that movement, which is smart for them. You know, I think you should you should be looking at all aspects of your customers and you know, with the new opening of the show place in the showroom, I mean, what, what a better opportunity to get new eyeballs and an entirely new customer walking in the door that um, has never heard of Hooker or just knows Hooker, like, because their grandparents had it, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a very deliberate business move on their part. They didn't feel like they had that lane. They understood that business as much. We, we took a whole different approach. Instead of just designing modern furniture, that would go within the hooker assortment, which wouldn't make any sense. You know, we we kind of decided early on that it really needed to be its own thing and its own brand, its own aesthetic and space. It, we went so far as to even just get uh, new designers outside of the um, the group of folks who do designs for a hooker. It was a a top down, bottom up approach, but it was it was very deliberate from the from the company perspective to to uh, to go after this. What are um, some of your favorite pieces? And is any of it in your own home? Yeah, well, not all it's brand new, so no. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you already mentioned the the jasmine sofa, which is the mohair. You know, we worked with a, a young designer, Charlie Zagaroli, who is based out of out of Hickory. And uh, he and I have known each other for many years, and it was a really lovely collaboration with him and our entire team. But he, I, I love that sofa. I think that you loved it in the mohair. We did it in leather. It was in boucle in the back with an oak base. It really can take on its own personality based on what you cover it in. Designers love that and customers love that because you want to have your own mark and identity on your style. The other pieces I love are the tambour. I don't know if you saw the bar cabinet, the black bar cabinet, which is right by the, which is right by the mohair sofa. Yes. You might have missed it. Gorgeous. 
Do you love it on that? Yeah. <laughs> when we started working on this several years ago, you know, we knew to, we wanted something with tambour because we were seeing it everywhere. You're seeing it in kitchens. It's it's beautiful. It's functional. It's eye catching. It's got the dimmer light on top of it. So all the little details. There's you know antique mirror in the back. It's just a really beautiful heirloom piece. Tell me about the application. Do you have any tips or suggestions or ways you're excited to see these pieces used? Just from a design standpoint, every room should have a hero or a, a hero or two. And you, I mean, those two pieces I just mentioned, um, you know, definitely fit that bill where, you know, you've got some statement pieces in your home or several in a room and they express your personality. They, they have a uniqueness of their own, and then you can add your own spin to them. That's when I, when I think holistically about, you know, just design in general, the shapes are cleaner. Um, but it's the details and the textures and the fabrics that kind of set things apart and, and give them personality. Can you talk to me a little bit about the materials used in this collection? Mm -hmm. What went into selecting the fabrics? And is there any sort of environment, environmental consciousness, sustainability initiatives uh, that have made their way through the line? I don't like fast furniture. <laughs> we specifically went, went and approached this as a, a better best offering Everything is assembled. It is meant to be heirloom, long sustaining uh, furniture. We've used FSC woods when possible, upholstery is made domestically. This brand is about authenticity. And we keep we keep saying authenticity and in, in in what the product is made of. Um, we wanted the materials to shine through. So, you know, that bar cabinet I was talking about, or those pieces are all solid mahogany. Um, and they just have a beautiful stain on them. They don't have 17 layers of lacquers and paints and, um, you know, really allowing the materials to kind of shine through the travertine, the marble. Um, you know, we had that beautiful burl uh, that had just a, just a beautiful finish on it. It wasn't it wasn't overly coated in anything. Um, and then just the same with the leathers, you know, even the leathers were, you know, full aniline dyed with a wax hand. They're not highly corrected. Mohair is is one of the most beautiful natural lustrous fabrics and that's the real deal mohair it's 100 percent wool um it's not a blend you know and and those are durable fabrics i mean they were they were putting you know mohair on um, movie seats back in the 20s um you know movie theaters so um you know again it's just it, it just the the natural qualities of the materials that we used is we felt really really important to this brand you've talked a little bit about the hero pieces I'm curious how you create a cohesive collection while still allowing individual pieces like the bar cart, uh, the bar cabinet or that sofa to stand out. In a lot of ways, because we approached this as a brand, it was easy because we had one single lens, which was modern aesthetic and modern lifestyle. And, and as a result, the entire collection really was built um, and designed to work interchangeably. Um, so because of the scale and the proportion of modern furniture, you know, the table heights can all stay in that, you know, 16, 16 and a half range. Seat heights are all 16 to 17 inches. Um, so, you know, that that made it a, a little bit easier to pull an entire assortment together because I can see already the next showroom, we're going to be able to mix and match and interchange things. And, you know, that I think is how that customer lives. That's how I live. Um, you know, it, it, we did not purposely want a lot of matching collections, that massive coffee table when you walked in and the console table, you know, we, we were going to do a side table with that. And we're like, mm, nope, that doesn't make any sense to do that. Let's put something else with it. And that way it was, um, it was, it was easier in some regards than saying, I'm going to have a French Chateau collection and a collection from Aspen. And we really had this modern lens going through all of it. Can you discuss any significant challenges or lessons you've learned throughout your career leading up to this point and explain how some of that has shaped your approach to designing this line? Well, I have a lot of lessons, <laughs> mostly good lessons. You know, I, I, I had the benefit of working for some amazing people, the founders of Crate and Barrel and you know everything that they taught me as far as your customer when I was training young buyers, it's easy to put your personal taste onto something. So you really do have to know who your audience is, who you're selling to, what makes them tick. 
and kind of put your own personal taste aside. In this case, it's easy for me because aesthetically, this was a, you know, this is definitely more my, more my aesthetic. You kind of have to learn to, how do you take risks and, and get people to follow along with you in that trend um, and, and push them to a place that they didn't know that they wanted to go to. And that's a fine line. You can gild the lily pretty quickly um, by over embellishing things. I do think too, you know, understanding what accounts for uh, value. You know, value isn't always the cheapest thing in the room. It goes into the design, into the quality, into the material choices. Understanding that over the years has has helped me a lot in both my career life and my personal life. Um, what you know. made the Crate and Barrel <clears throat> client tick and what did they perceive as value and how is it different at Hooker? In a lot of ways, this brand is approaching the same customer. It's the It's the person who is proud of their home. Um, they love to entertain. They take a sense of pride in their design, but they're never showy or flashy. This brand, it, it's not fussy. You know, it is It is really about the shapes and the materials and how it is all put together. And you put your own, you put your own spin on it. I mean, I, I, I was very deliberate in how we, um, we propped out the showroom using uh, larger props and Things that, you know, I went to Schwung and got some beautiful ceramics and worked with a Belgian company that did the, the pillows for us. You know, you have this kind of curated home and you layer in your own personalities in there. So like my house has got lots of textiles and, and things from my travels over the years um, and, and things that are personal to me. So in a lot of ways that that crate customer and this customer are, I think, similar and value beautiful products and value a beautiful wine glass. I mean, a beautiful wine glass is as when I was younger, um, you know, and I worked at Crate, I mean, I was, oh my gosh, probably 18 or 19, 17 or 18 when I was working there part-time. Um, at the time, the owner, um, Gordon Siegel, he would on, on the weekends, he'd have a group of people up and help train you. And I just remember him talking about the most simple, beautiful wine glass in the most exquisite way and how it's hand blown and by these artisans in Poland. And, and I was like, who is this person? Like I it just completely opened a whole world to me of, of the, just the beauty in these very simple things and that really resonated with me and has stuck with me the rest of my life. What are some of your other influences, even outside of design? I've had the good fortune of traveling. Even in this, in this role, we sourced a lot of product in Vietnam and Indonesia. You go to other countries and you understand their craft and their passion, their religions, their food that influences them. And I think you know, you're kind of hard pressed to, to walk away from that. You know, you go to India a handful of times and you, it, you'll, you're moved by it. You have to be just think experiencing that and experiencing, um, food and, you know, restaurant design has always been something I think that's been really influential and an interesting place to look, to see what, what's happening with trends. This is the, the third interview I've done in a couple of days where restaurant design has come up, even though I wasn't talking to anyone about hospitality design. I'm wondering if that's something that you guys have seen trending and something that's influenced how you're designing the modern collection. Um, when I was doing my interior design work, my first project was a restaurant. So there's always been something that's really fascinating to me about um, about restaurants in particular. Their use of materials. Um, you know, again, I was talking about like tambour. If you're starting to see tambour in kitchens and in restaurants you're starting to see a trend. So I don't know that it's a deliberate thing necessarily. It's kind of just part of my ethos of when I look for trend or look for designs or look for ideas. I also tend to um, like things that are a little moodier and restaurants are always very moody with their lighting. As you could see in the M showroom, I was like, I couldn't get that thing dark enough. <laughs> We're cut from the same cloth. That's why I like it so much too. <laughs> Hooker is an incredibly designer friendly line. You touched on that a little bit earlier, all of the customization options. Um, but beyond that, can you speak to what goes into building a good relationship between designer and vendor? So early, early, early on in my life, uh, Crate and Barrel actually bought from Hooker. Um, they bought like home office and they were always a good vendor. And, you know, I think that 
being a good vendor partnership means a lot of things. It means delivering on time. It means quality. Our sales reps are out in the field and have great relationships with their businesses. I've actually been able to travel with some of them here and down in, in Florida. And when a retailer or a customer is someone they can call, it's a live person who they know will take care of them and know will get back to them. That's kind of lost in these days. And I think that the 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 beauty of Hooker and why they felt so confident and comfortable and moot and adding this brand, as well as, you know, they're gonna be a hundred years old next year. And they have, you know, Jeremy Hoff, the the CEO, has poised them with this new showroom and all the new initiatives to they're gonna be another hundred years. And I think that there's a, a confidence in that from the people who work there, as well as the people who buy from them, because they're not going anywhere and they are a strong, strong partner. They believe in, they believe in all the right things. They believe in quality. They believe in fair trade. They believe in, and having, and being good partners and they believe in environmental causes. So, you know, all of those things are, are subtle reminders to people whether they know it or not is why they want to work work with Hooker Furniture. I personally feel really great about joining the company and um, you know what we've what we've accomplished and the people that the people that I've been able to work with are all through the guys who set up the showroom all the way up are um, really really terrific people. So what what's next for M and what's next for Hooker as a whole? Are there any new directions, collections, projects that you're working on or plan to explore? What's exciting you working on fall already so you know this was a huge launch um because we added oh gosh we developed at least 100 SKUs, a, a lot of work and a lot of investment so we will be tweaking and adding um a few things here and there maybe a couple pieces of upholstery and um we're going to go back to asia in june and, and work on a few more things so that's all I can say from my side. And I'm excited to see what you guys are up to next. I'm thrilled that you wanted to talk to me this long. <laughs> oh my gosh, of course. I could keep you all day, but don't let me do that. <laughs>